Uh, good afternoon to all. I'm Padma Gunratne. Uh, at the outset, let me apologize to you for the delay uh, because of a technical uh, problem that uh, I found difficult to connect. Um, but uh, uh, let me warmly welcome you for this uh, uh, program, the uh, uh, clinical uh, lecture demonstration that uh, we organize by the expert committee in medical uh, uh, rehabilitation of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. On behalf of our committee, I thank uh, Dr. Gayatri Barnes Surya profusely uh, for accepting our invitation and arranging this presentation that could be extremely useful for nurses, doctors, um, and any of the healthcare professional. I'm glad that you organized this presentation. Uh, so uh, the, uh, she's a uh, senior registrar in medical rehabilitation uh, of the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, Sri Lanka. So uh, 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 Gayatri, thank you so much. And uh, let me uh, 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 invite you for you to uh, commence your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Uh, for the ne uh, uh, Welcome you all for the uh, ne uh, next uh, presentation uh, in expert committee in medical rehabilitation. So I'll be discussing in next 40 to 45 minutes regarding the bladder management in spinal cord injections. The, the outline of my presentation would be for the uh, understanding purposes to make it more easier. I have included a uh, uh, few uh, words about the basic sciences and the functional and neuroanatomy behind the bladder innovation and the types of voiding dysfunction uh, the bladder management uh, definition, importance, uh, goals, and the types of bladder, ma bladder management. At the end, uh, I'll be uh, go going through the recommendations according to the avail available evidences, and uh, also briefing you about the uh, bladder management in pediatric point of view. So one might wonder what is the point of this bladder management? We have heard of certain diseases being managed, but specifically the bladder. Uh, the importance of that is, uh, as we all know, in uh, spinal cord injured patients, uh, majority of people with spinal cord injury uh, may have complete uh, impairment or incom uh, incomplete impairment, but they have ab uh, almost all have uh, abnormalities in bladder function, which may cause upper and lower urinary tract complications. The neurogenic bladder, the, it's a general term applied to a malfunction in urinary bladder due to neurological dysfunction uh, or insult. It may be due to an internal problem or some external trauma. Uh, internal problem in the sense, maybe some disease like demyelinating disorder, some disease process or some developmental problem. So in spinal cord injury, it disrupts the descending motor and ascending sensory pathways which prevents normal control of micturition. So that was the problem. Uh, if you go through the functional uh, anatomy of the lower urinary tract, there are two phases in the bladder. That is one is the uh, filling phase and the um, emptying or the voiding phase. Uh, the emptying involves the bladder and its outlet, bladder mainly the detrusor muscle, and the outlet, bladder neck and proximal urethra and the striated muscles in the pelvic floor. All these things has to act reciprocally to uh, occur the function of micturition. So during the storage phase, the bladder neck and the proximal urethra is closed and uh, to provide the continence and uh, the uh, detrusor muscles in the bladder wall is relaxed to allow low pressure filling. So uh, during the voiding phase, there's relaxation of the pelvic floor with the opening of the bladder neck which is followed by detrusor muscle contraction until the bladder is completely empty. So that is the normal function of the bladder. So the innovation of the bladder, uh, there are a lot of interactions between uh, autonomic nervous system and somatic innovation is also there. Uh, and in addition to that, this, this action of micturition is mod moderated by the central nervous system as well. Uh, especially we are talking about the sympathetic here uh, for the, for the uh, sympathetic innovation because it facilitates bladder storage and the parasympathetic mainly the bladder emptying or the voiding phase. 
sympathetic uh, receptor, uh, the beta adrenergic receptors are predominantly found in the post, uh, superior portion of the bladder. B uh, the stimulation of beta receptors are causing smooth muscle relaxation, so the bladder will be relaxed, which allows uh, storage. And the alpha receptors, they have higher density in the near of the bladder base, so that uh, activation of these causing smooth muscle contraction of the sphincter, uh, which causing increased outlet resistance. So this understanding is important because when you're using the pharmacological agents, uh, in, which are acting on two different uh, area, uh, areas, that the understanding is important. We go through the bladder innovation. As I said earlier, there are a lot of interactions from uh, autonomic nervous system and the somatic innovation is also there. So the, the parasympathetic efferent motor supplies are originating from S2 to S4 uh, levels at the sacral spinal cord. And these efferents travel via the pelvic nerves to provide excitatory inputs to the bladder. So the parasympathetic bladder receptors are called cholinergic because uh, it releases acetylcholine and uh, stimulation of these causing bladder uh, wall contraction. And then uh, there's a somatic innovation also, which passes through the pudendal nerve, uh, pudendal nerve to the uh, external sphincter. And it innovates the uh, external sphincter so that uh, <clears throat> micturition is permits when the time and the uh, time, place, and social context is uh, permits. So this is the place where the uh, central nervous system is also intervenes with the bladder management. Sympathetic efferent nerve, uh, nerve supply to the bladder and urethra begins from the uh, T11 to L2 region in the spinal cord, which gives an inhi inhibitory input to the bladder. That is the bladder innovation method. So this is mainly the local innovation coming from to the uh, bladder. In addition to that, to maintain the micturition process, uh, there, are, uh, there are several centers. So all these uh, centers are coordinating to occur the micturition in a normal individual. The sacral micturition center is located in a uh, sacral region, S3 to S4. It's a reflex center which, uh, efferent, in which the efferent parasympathetic impulses to the bladder causing bladder contraction and afferent impulses provide the feedback uh, mechanism on bladder, regarding the bladder fullness. And there is a, a center in the pontine region in the brain stem, which mainly uh, does the coordination part. Because as I said earlier, the bladder wall has to contract and the uh, internal sphincter has to relax. So there's, the, there should be a coordination in between. So that coordination is mediated by this pontine center in the brain stem. And the cerebral cortex, which initiate or delayed voiding, depending on the social context. few words about the micturition reflex because we need to know the reflex mechanism in our uh, management uh, uh, options. Uh, micturition reflex is uh, uh, occurred at the uh, sacral level. And as so what happened in there is as the urine accumulates inside the bladder, the bladder there are bladder uh, stretch receptors located in the bladder wall which get activated. And these sensory signals will pass through the parasympathetic nerves and, uh, and goes uh, parasympathetic nerves and then activates the motor nerves. These parasympathetic motor fibers then contracts, contracts the detrusor muscle and relaxes the internal sphincter so that uh, the widening will initiate and the stretch will no more there. So it's a re uh, reflex mechanism where the CNS is. Uh, the, higher centers are not involving. So it's uh, the arc is along the sacral spinal cord. So knowing that uh, normal neuroanatomy will be going to the voiding, types of voiding dysfunctions we may came across during the rehabilitation process. Uh, depending on the level of the lesion, the types of void, uh, dysfunction it may vary. So suprapontine lesions, uh, are usually found in uh, stroke patients and multiple sclerosis-like conditions where they have overactive bladder without uh, detrusor sphincter dyssynergy. I'll explain what detrusor sphincter dyssynergy means. Uh, in spinal injury, we mainly get um, 
lesions in that is suprasacral spinal cord lesions. So initial spinal shock stage, uh, there will be detrus a reflexia. Yeah? But as the bladder function recovers, uh, recovers in the sense uh, uh, once the they are get rid from this spinal shock, they may uh, commonly get detrus external sphincter dyssynergia yeah? because the pontine uh, coordination is not more there. So there's no more synergy between the detrusor muscle contraction and the uh, sphincter relaxation. There's no more coordination. So that is the main problem there. So detrusor external sphincter dysphingia is defined as intermittent or complete failure of relaxation of the urinary sphincter during bladder contraction and widening. Uh, the problem with that is uh, when there's uninhibited bladder contractions through the closed uh, sphincter, uh, the high intravesical pressure is building up, which might cause upper tract complications. The other type is the sacral, um, the level is the sacral level, where you get highly compliant, but a contractile better. So what is the importance of knowing this bladder management? What is the importance of knowing this bladder management, especially in spinal cord injured patients is, uh, as as the time passes in chronic spinal cord injury, the bladder function may change over time in, in those patients. In addition to that, their bladder urothelium, uh, urothelium also, uh, there are changes happening. So that uh, the regular barrier function of the urothelium is lost. So they are more susceptible for bacterial infections. Because of that, Annual follow-ups and annual follow-ups of the bladder function and the upper urinary tract condition is more essential. So recommendation is to perform them annually if they don't have any uh, problem with that. Uh, so the European uh, Urological Society recommends to perform upper tract assessment as well as the lower tract assessment. Upper tract usually we are performing with ultrasound scan assessment to look for the renal morphology. And with that, we can get an idea about the post-residual volume as well. Urine analysis with urine uh, full report and if necessary cultures, renal functions with serum creatinine. Lower tract, again, the ultrasound scan can uh, give an idea about that. Post-residual volume, we have to measure. In addition to that, bladder uh, wall thickness, with there's limited, uh, the limited um, significance with related to the... Uh, uh, complications from the uh, with regard to the bladder thickness, but still we are measuring it. We are we're looking at the trabeculations. In addition to that, stone formation also we can get an idea with this ultrasound scan. So it's a very important in, uh, investigation to perform. And neurodynamics, they always recommend to perform, but uh, it can be uh, done if abnormal. Uh, if you find an abnormal uh, post residual volume, then the urodynamic is warranted. Cystogram is recommended to assess the vesicular urinary reflux, and cystoscopy is another important investigation to perform to assess the bladder anatomy because the patients who are on indwelling catheters are liable to get bladder C cancer. So cystoscopy is important. So the bladder management is an ongoing set of treatments and practices that maintains bladder and kidney healthy without complications in spinal cord injured patients. It improves their health and quality of life with appropriate management, can prevent incontinence and further complications. And the patient is also incorporated into the bladder management because patients have an option to select the method that fits them most. So bladder management itself cannot fix the or solve the problems caused by spinal cord injury, but it can help you to manage them they are, uh, to improve their health and quality of life. Goals are this. Uh, protecting the upper uh, urinary tract from sustained high feeling voiding pressures, achieving uh, regular bladder emptying, avoiding stasis, bladder over distension, and minimizing post voidal residual volume, preventing and treating complications such as UTIs, tones, strictures, and autonomic dysreflexia, maintaining continence and avoiding frequency and urgency, and selecting a technique which is compatible with patient's lifestyle, which is the most important thing. So there are <clears throat> several types. Conservative and pharmacological methods are the ones we are using mainly because spinal cord injury 
uh, rehabilitation of spinal cord injury is mainly the adaptations that we have to go through. Uh, so the conservative and pharmacological methods are using mainly. Out of this conservative bladder emptying, there are a few types. I'll be going through each and every uh, types. Intermittent catheterization, it is considered for individuals who have sufficient hand skills or a willing caregiver to perform the catheterization. It prevents uh, long-term complications and it should be avoided in abnormal urethral anatomy. Uh, lesser, individuals with lesser bladder capacity, less than 200 mm, and patients with poor cognition and little motivation. Even with uh, intermittent catheterization on a given intervals, still the upper tract complications can occur because high blood pressures can be uh, coexist with that. <clears throat> uh, these are the prerequisites to select the patients. They should have well-controlled detrus activity, including good bladder capacity, adequate bladder outlet resistance, and uh, absence of urethral sensitivity to pain while doing the catheterization and the patient motivation. It's recommended to do, recommended to do it uh, every four to six hours individual, uh, intervals. Um, we have to give these advices to the patient if, uh, and uh, we have to make sure that the bladder volume consists, if the bladder volume consistently exceeds more than 500 milliliters, we have to adjust their fluid intake. The normal capacity of bladder is less than 500 ml. Um, so keeping the bladder volume below the 500 uh, milliliters will usually prevent over distension of the bladder. So limiting fluid intake will decrease the amount of urine produced and can be helpful in decreasing the frequency needed to intermittent catheterization. Uh, and uh, limiting fluid after the dinner may prevent the need for intermittent catheterization in the middle of the night. In addition to that, we have to monitor the upper tract complications annually and more frequently if already established complications. So, and studies have shown <clears throat> instituting clean intermittent catheterization teaching and training sessions for individuals before the discharge from acute phase of rehabilitation have associated with a lesser number of complications and more quality of life later on. Uh, Indwelling catheterization, whether it's suprapubic, urethral, or whether it was conducted acutely or chronically, may result in higher long-term rate of urological and renal complications than other management methods. So at all possible times, if possible, try to avoid indwelling catheterization, um, whether suprapubic or urethral, go for other methods. So it is being considered in patients who have poor hand skills, high fluid intake, cognitive impairment, elevated retrosa pressure, and um, lack of success with other uh, bladder management and limited assistance from the caregiver. And when we are performing indwelling catheterization, we have to advise the patients regarding the long-term complications associated with that. This is the list of that. Main thing is bladder stone formation. So we have to inform to them. And uh, it was shown that recurrent bladder stone formation is more common among female, probably because of high risk of uh, high incidence of urinary tract infections. Complication rate is higher for someone using indwelling catheterization than other methods of bladder management. And uh, also we have to conduct more frequent cystoscopic evaluation in chronic indwelling catheterized patients. And they have suggested to use anticholinergic in individuals with suprasacral lesions. Even if they are on indwelling catheterization, they have to be on anticholinergic. And indwelling catheterization improved bladder compliance, lower bladder leak points, and less hydronephrosis. But the infection rate, VUR, scar, renal scarring, stone formation, and creatinine levels, those things have not been altered according to the studies. Uh, suprapubic catheterization, it's uh, the complications wise compared to the urethral catheterization, suprapubic catheterization, less, uh, less adverse effect profile. And um, it is, it would be the better option for high tetraplegics. So we have to consider them in, uh, uh, it in uh, uh, patients with urethral abnormalities, recurrent urethral catheter obstruction. Uh, difficulties in uh, urethral catheter insertion, perineal skin problems, 
uh, when we are when we want to keep the perineal agent high and and if the patient wants to maintain their sexual function, then the option would be the suprapubic catheterization. So when we are selecting the urethral catheters, usually the recommended size would be the 14 gauge to 16, and balloon has to be filled with five to 10 ml of water, uh, sterile water. More than that could cause some discomfort, uh, but uh, uh, and uh, it has to be replaced uh, two to four weekly. And if there is a history of urethral encrustation or bladder stone formation, you have to change it more frequently. Suprapubic catheters usually are uh, introducing 22 to 24 ga uh, gauge ones. Uh, same principle of replacing. And they suggest to anchor the uh, catheter to the lower limb. Other method of conservative uh, bladder management is Pridian Valsalva. Uh, Pride is a method where you have to apply some suprapubic pressure to express urine from the bladder. So it, uh, when the bladder is flaccid or bladder contraction needs to be augmented, that method can be used. Uh, but the problem is the strength of pressure. Valsalva is a method where the individual uses abdominal muscles and the diaphragm to empty the bladder. Again, the bladder has to be flaccid here. The problem with those two methods is incomplete bladder empty. But this can be suggested in patients who have low motor neuron injuries with low outlet resistance and who had uh, sphincterotomy. But uh, recommendation is to avoid this method as a primary method of bladder empty. And we have to consider avoiding these two methods in patients with uh, detrusive sphincter dyssynergia, bladder outlet obstruction, VUR, and hydronephrosis because it further causing increased intracycle pressure. Uh, reflex voiding, it's, uh, <coughs> it's uh, possible when the uh, sacral micturition reflex is intact. Uh, the bladder is contracting against the dyssynergic sphincter. The problem is again the risk of autonomic dysreflexia and the upper tract complications. Uh, it, the suitable candidate would be a, an individual with poor hand function and uh, <clears throat> we have to consider using alpha blockers or blotulinum toxin to help the to help to decrease the this uh, this detrusive sphincter dyssynergia uh, for this reflex voiding. But uh, the Pridae and Malsalva and the reflex voiding are usually not recommended as a primary method of bladder uh, management. These are the recommendation according to the US. Uh, clean intermittent catheterization is recommended for sp spinal cord injured patients with chronic urinary retention. If an indwelling catheter is needed for long term, suprapubic catheter is preferred over urethral catheter. The development of UT uh, urinary tract complications are UTI, urethral erosions, should be carefully monitored and treated in spinal injured patients with long term indwelling catheterization. <coughs> So uh, this is an algorithm where we, uh, where we practice in uh, Ragama Rehabilitation Hospital uh, when we are managing uh, bladder, bladder management in patients with spinal cord injury. The, here, the determined uh, things would be whether the injury is complete or the uh, incomplete injury according to the Asia classification and the level of the lesion. Uh, the clear demarcation of T6 is uh, selected here because of the risk of uh, autonomic dysreflexia. So depending on the level and the type of injury, if it's a complete injury and the T6 and above, hand function is good, we can go for uh, self-intermittent catheterization to where they have to be on indwelling catheter. And uh, if it is below T6, we can, uh, after a given time, once the sitting balance is achieved, and we can go for trial without catheter. <clears throat> and with that, we assess the residual volume. If it is less than 40 and or 10% of the total voided urine volume, we can advise them for voluntary voiding and keep on monitoring them. And if the vol residual volume is more than that, go for uh, intermittent catheterization. Same is for the incomplete injury with, uh, with the level of lesion below T6. Incomplete injury uh, above T6, still we go for trial without catheter and the residual volume means satisfactory. We go for voluntary voiding, but keep continuous monitoring will be carried out. 
and residual volume is uh, higher, hand function is satisfactory. Then we institute uh, clean intermittent catheterization. Poor, they have to be on indwelling catheter. Here again, we always offer the patient before discharge suprapubic catheterization rather than ureter catheterization. The medical management of neurogenic bladder involves these medication types of medications. The main goal is to block the acetylcholine receptors on the bladder wall, thereby reducing uninhibited contractions. Oral agents are available. Uh, anticholinergic drugs are using mainly the oxybutynin and tolterodine is practicing. Uh, oxybutynin has some uh, local smooth muscle relaxing property and also local anesthetic effect. And tolterodine, tropsium, they have fewer anticholinergic side def adverse effects. So the side effect profile is better. So, um, and tricyclic antidepressants are also using. They have an additional effect on internal sphincter by preventing uh, no epinephrine react reuptake inhibiting. Uh, the problem with that is the uh, autonomic dysreflexia. Uh, alpha blockers, uh, we use, uh, <clears throat> it uh, relaxes the smooth muscle component in the bladder neck, so allow better urine flow. Um, and uh, it is considered as an unsurgical method to treat detrusive sphincter dyssynergia and low bladder pressure during voiding. And uh, we have to consider the use of alpha blockers as a supplement to the forms of treatment, such as uh, sphincterotomy. So it was shown, in, there's evidence to uh, say that when urethral resistance is lesser, the true sober activity might also improve. Uh, the problem with alpha blockers is we have to avoid it uh, in patients with symptomatic hypertension, hypotension, and patients on PDE5 inhibitors. Because usually the patients with spinal cord injury, they have low blood pressure. So we have to keep on monitoring their blood pressure. Out of the antimascarinic, uh, <clears throat> drugs, uh, oxybutynin is widely using, uh, but the intravesicle and the extended uh, release preparations have better side effect profile. Tolteridine also as effective as uh, oxybutynin. Again, they have uh, mini, uh, lesser side effect because they have low affinity for the salivary glands. Retrospective reviews show the bladder compliance was significantly better in those using oxybutynin and Complications including hydronephrosis and febrile, uh, febrile UTI were much less frequent in that study group. So they always advised to use antimascarinine. This is the uh, recommended uh, list of uh, uh, drugs to use uh, in the uh, pharmacological management of uh, bladder management. The thing is the combination therapy. It's always advised to use combination of alpha blockers and antimascarinics because they act synergistically uh, rather than uh, increasing the dose of one particular uh, drug uh, medica medication group. They always advise to use combinations. So side effect would be better. Uh, Desmopressin, it was recently approved for use in adult with nocturnal polyuria uh, because the nocturnal polyuria is a problem with spinal cord injured patients, but, uh, but the initial management of nocturnal uh, nocturia, it's always uh, uh, cons uh, the behavioral and uh, so the refractory cases only, uh, we have to use this desmopressin. Recommendations uh, with regard to the pharmacological management, all patients with uh, neurogenic bladder who are in retention, uh, other than atonic bladder should be on antimascarinic treatment. Uh, even, even it's applied for the patients who are on indwelling catheter. Antimascarinics improve bladder compliance, continence, retros overactivity, and should be titrated up with achieved clinical efficacy. Failure to respond, always we have to ensure that the dose is optimized. And uh, if still not achieving treatment uh, uh, success, but botulinum toxic injections can be uh, offered and combination drug therapy should always uh, advise. And history of autonomic dysreflexia, alpha blockers are added earlier in the therapy. Botulinum toxin injection, it is another method of uh, managing uh, bladder. Uh, it's mainly used to uh, prevent upper tract complications. In that case, we used to inject to transurethral and transperineal injection. Uh, and to treat neurogenic bladder, injections to the bladder wall. 
detrusor sphincter disenergia uh, injections to the sphincter. Few words about the mechanism of uh, botulinum toxin here. Botulinum toxin inhibits acetylcholine release at the neuromuscular junction, uh, which in turn blocks neuromuscular contractions and relaxes the muscles that are either spastic or overactive. It can therefore relax the intern, uh, sphincter spasticity as well in patients with detrusor sphincter dyssynergia. Uh, lack of uh, permanence in this drug is both an advantage as a disadvantage, uh, which uh, we need frequent um, injections because the effectiveness is losing after about three to six months when the nerve ends are re-sprouting. Thus, re-injections are usually necessary and there's no limit to the number of re-injections that may be required. Detrus always activity. Um, <clears throat> Uh, here, the uh, bot botulinum toxins can be injected to the detrusor muscle. Uh, the recommended dose would be the 100 to 300 units. Uh, the effects can be aware of, as I said earlier, three to six months, and it can be used in both males and females. This is the recommendation they have given with the recommended doses and the places to inject. Uh, if when we are injecting into the sphincter, we have to avoid these in the injecting in these conditions who have neuromuscular disease, allergies, adverse effects, and who are on aminoglycoside, insufficient hand skills or caregiver. And we have to avoid injecting to sphincters in female patients. And we always have to advise them regarding the potential complications because they are at risk of developing autonomy dysreflexia during the injection. So we have to keep an eye, keep an eye on open and uh, hematuria during the injection. The recommendation is to um, detrusor injection is effect effective in treating spinal injury patients with uh, neurogenic detrusor overactivity, refractory to anticholinergic medication. And always they recommend to perform urodynamic study to evaluate the treatment efficacy after six to 12 weeks. And detrusor injections can effectively treat urinary incontinence in, as well and increase in bladder capacity so that uh, the urinary continence is improved. Jethra sphincter injection effectively relaxes the dyssynergic sphincter by reducing bladder outlet resistance and protects the upper urinary tract. So apart from that, there are surgical options also. Uh, urethra stent, transurethral resection of external urinary sphincter, ex uh, electrical stimulation of the sacral nerves and posterior sacral rhizotomy, uh, bladder augmentation, and urinary diversion methods. Indications for surgical referral are uh, inability to tolerate or unwilling to for the drugs, and they choose a hyperreflexia with uh, or low compliance. Recurrent UTI or autonomic dysreflexia, again, we have to consider surgical options here, and already established compl complications. It's always a, a multidisciplinary a disciplinary, uh, uh, decision. There are behavioral options for the bladder management, but it's mainly not applicable for the spinal cord injury patients. Can be helpful in patients with head injury, stroke, uh, like patients. Uh, one is timely voiding and bladder training, but uh, in literature, there's uh, no such bladder training, no, no consensus with regard to the bladder training in spinal cord injured patients. But for the stroke and head injury patients, we can try with that. But uh, no uh, evidences have uh, limited evidences. Few words about the autonomic dysreflexia, as I have discussed about autonomic dysreflexia throughout. It's a uh, emergency situation. It was uh, detected as uh, the definition by the definition as a systolic blood pressure elevation more than 15 to 20 from the baseline in adults with spinal injury, or more than 15 from the baseline in children who had uh, injury level below the T6. So this can be accompanied with severe paroxysmal hypertension, throbbing headache, profuse sweating, flushing of the skin above the level of the lesion, bradycardia, sometimes can associated with CNS, uh, cognitive impairment. The most common cause for the autonomic dis, uh, dysreflexia is uh, bladder distension and stool impaction. UTI can also trigger that. And 
they have shown even the patient is on the indwelling catheter, uh, still they can get autonomic dysreflexia if the spinal injury level is T6. Identifying the autonomic dysreflexia is important because the, the, the management is uh, with selective alpha-1 blocker or nifedipine. And um, external sphincterotomy, detrusa injections have been proven to be able to alleviate some autonomic dysreflexia in future. Uh, this is the recommendation again given in the European uh, Urological Society with regard to the autonomic dysreflexia. Selective alpha-1 blocker on ifidipine may be considered for the initial management of repeated AD attacks. An intravesical botulinum toxin injection, urethral sphincter, uh, sphincter injection, or sphincterotomy may be an option in the active management of chronic autonomic dysreflexia. But there's limited evidence with regard to the uh, bladder augmentation, sacral denervation. Few words about the pediatric spinal cord injury, uh, bladder management. The, uh, unlike in the adult population where the etiology for the spinal cord injury would be the tr uh, trauma. The, in here, the pediatric population, the most common etiology in, uh, for the neurogenic bladder is uh, developmental problems. Uh, mainly the spina bifida, and the most frequent malformation is uh, lumbosacral meningomyelosis. So damage to the renal parenchyma in children with neurogenic bladder acquired in postnatal stage is preventable given with given adequate evaluation, follow-ups, and proactive management. Uh, patients with neurogenic bladder, may they may present with urinary incontinence, UTIs, persecutory reflux, and eventu eventually renal scarring and renal failure. So indication for starting pre, uh, management in uh, children, the timing of initiation of uh, intermittent catheterization is controversial. Almost all the patients, uh, the pediatric population may need intermittent catheterization, but the timing of initiation is controversial. Uh, International Children's Continent Society and again, the European uh, Urological Society uh, pediatric population also suggest these both suggest uh, 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 there are two approach for the uh, time with regard to the timing of initiation. So with uh, that is um, expectant approach and the uh, so early treatment versus expectant uh, treatment with the expectant approach patients are periodically monitored. In order, for, in order to evaluate changes in upper urinary tract. And the intermittent catheterization is indicated when there's clinical deterioration or development of hydronephrosis. And the early treatment or the proactive management methods, the CICC is initiated even before the establishment of these complications. And even before evaluating with ultrasound scan or uh, urodynamic studies. So those who recommend it emphasize that the fact uh, fact that it helps to achieve better adherence and reduction in the need of reconstruction of urinary tract and a reduction in the risk of renal deterioration. And so the European uh, Society of Pediatric Urology and International Children's Continent Society propose a proactive management with early indication of intermittent catheterization. So these are the recommendations for the bladder management in pediatric spinal injured patients. Here the uh, they recommend to uh, evaluate all patients with ultrasound scan soon after birth. And every patient should be evaluated with all the patients in the sense with the uh, new, uh, neural tube defect. Uh, every patient, uh, and it has to be done, the urodynamic uh, studies has to be done during the first six months of their life. And every patient with spina bifida should undergo DMSA scan during their first year of life and after six months of having episode of pyelonephritis. The early treatment with clean intermittent catheterization helps to prevent complications. The difference uh, compared to the adult population is they suggest here antibiotic prophylaxis, but it is not considered in children with uh, uh, all the children with uh, intermittent catheterization. Exceptions are initial first few months, they can start an antibiotic prophylaxis until the uh, catheterization technique is there. And otherwise, it would only be re recommended 
to start in cases of patients with vesicular urinary reflux, hydronephrosis, or uh, recurrent febrile UTI. So, so the summary of my uh, uh, talk would be the principal goals of managing neurogenic low urinary tract dysfunction in spinal injured patients are preserving renal function and keep maintaining their quality of life by reducing urological complications. Treatments of spinal injury patients should take into account the patient's acceptance and expectations in addition to the disease. The urodynamic uh, study at baseline is essential and uh, regularly uh, arranged uh, if needed. Clean intermittent catheterization ought to be utilized as the first line of treatment for spinal injured patients who are unable to urinate. Patients should be instructed regarding the catheterization technique and associated behavioral modifications, risk uh, related to the uh, catheterization using a multidisciplinary approach is possible, except in cases with tetraplegia and long-term indwelling catheterization should be avoided. All patients with neurogenic bladder who are in retention other than those with atonic bladder should be maintained on antimascarinic treatment. Other options are available like botulinum toxin injection, surgical methods, but have limited practices in our settings. So most important thing is continuous follow-ups and monitoring of bladder function is important even after discharge of the, the spinal cord injured patients after completing the physical rehabilitation. So continuous follow-up is the mandatory thing here. So these are my references. And, and I would like to uh, thank all my uh, trainers in adult rehabilitation and pediatric rehabilitation and uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association Expert Committee in Medical Rehabilit uh, Rehabilitation for giving me this opportunity and to all my patients. Thank you. Um, Samita? Is Samita uh, there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Dati and uh, the organized lecture. And if you have any question uh, regarding the bladder management of my code injury, you can ask it now or you can post uh, your question in the chat box if there is any question. It seems there is no any question. Uh, so uh, we can finish the session. And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gayatri uh, Balifuria, uh, training uh, rehabilitation medicine and uh, uh, for the your well-organized comprehensive lecture. Thank you, Dr. Gayatri. Thank you.